if um, we are going to record the session, as you just heard this lovely, the lovely Zoom announcement, Lenny. Uh, when you feel free to take it away. Um, yeah, welcome everyone. Hi, um, my name is Wenju. Um, it's nice to see all of you, see some familiar faces and some new ones as well. Um, as we get started, uh, we have a few rules of the room. Feel free to jump in to the chat, introduce yourself. Also add your location to your name. Um, as we get going with the session, feel free to interrupt if you have any questions. Um, be kind as we interact with each other, share your gifts. You just might meet someone you will work with in the future. Um, also turn, feel free to turn on your video and um, we're going to record the session as we have had and as uh, you can see. And we are not going to sell your beautiful faces anywhere and the Recording might uh, be shared within the community, but that's it. So for the new members um, that we're seeing in the call today, a uh, brief introduction to who we are. So what is Brand the Change? Brand the Change is a call to action to better sell our ideas and products and services for change. We got started with workshops and trainings for change makers then this snowballed into a book and live events. And now we have the wonderful Brand the Change community of like-minded uh, people. If you're not a member of the community, feel free to join us. I'll be sharing a link um, to allow you to join the community. Apart from sessions such as today's conversation, we also have other events. So we have the Personal Branding Mastermind Group where we have different members of the community supporting each other to build their personal brands. We also have the Brand the Change Academy and uh, we're still taking on members for the September cohort. And we also have the facilitators think tank where we come together to brainstorm and come um, to provide solutions or to the challenges that facilitators are facing. The goals for today's session is to expand our knowledge, to also get ideas for our own brands and our own uh, projects and practices, and to also potentially meet collaborators. So feel free to introduce yourself in the chat again, share your LinkedIn link, and you just might find the next person you work with. And then Anna is going to introduce our guests and get started on today's session. Cool, thanks, Wendu. Um, you just caught me while I was like quickly copy and pasting my own LinkedIn profile. <laughs> Cool. So uh, hi, guys. So good to see everyone. Thanks for joining today. So we're here to talk about money, which is a topic um, I would like to say it's close to my heart, but it actually isn't, which is why we should all probably be having this conversation. Um, and in particular, we're going to talk about branding the products and services or pricing the products and services that our brands deliver. Um, and I think money is in general kind of a tough topic for, for people to discuss publicly, um, but even more so in a sector that's kind of defined by the fact that we're pursuing a purpose beyond profit. Um, and it's probably telling that when I asked around like, hey, what's a good topic that you guys would love to talk about in the next hangout? I got quite a few um, number of people who, who came with me with all kinds of questions related to money and pricing, but they did that privately. So not on the network. So that um, I thought that was an interesting little tidbit of a little peek behind like our psyche. Um, ah, here's Ben, let me let him in. Um, so there was like, there were quite a few different questions. So people who are constantly nego negotiating down their own price because they feel like they're too expensive. Um, we have people who are afraid to ask for what they're worth. Um, we have uh, questions about like, hey, you know, I'm this is totally innovative new product and I have just no idea how to start thinking about how to price it. 
And then there's just kind of, there's different questions that generally speak to this, this fact, like, well, I, you know, I can make some money doing good, but I can't like, Mother Teresa can't be driving a Ferrari or anything like that. So I wanted to explore this topic and I needed some people who could um, help us think this through with some, uh, with some experience, both on the functional level of like, how does money and pricing work, but also in all of that psychology. So I'm really excited to have with us Carlos and Ben. Um, ben just came in 30 seconds ago, so fresh, uh, fresh off the boat um, into the, this new space. Welcome, Ben. Welcome, Carlos. So nice to have you guys here. Cool. So we're going to make this a really interactive session. I'm going to start off with just some warming up questions. And um, then uh, anyone who uh, is joining us, um, feel free to bring your questions into the conversation. So brand the change style is usually just like, feel free to speak up, um, just turn on your mic um, and um, join the conversation or uh, 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 paste a question in, in chat. Might be nice to just for Ben and Carlos to get an idea of kind of the thoughts and questions about money that are uh, that are alive with this uh, group of people to um, just give us a give us a, a little, one sentence of like what brought you to this conversation what were you thinking about uh, in terms of money and pricing what would you like to know what's holding you back etc feel free to share something in chat um, hey Carlos hey Ben so good to have you guys excited to be here thank you very much for for allowing us to share this space I was really curious if we can get to know you by by maybe both of you sharing like what's your what's your first memory of money? <laughs> Should we go in alphabetical order, Ben? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I we could do uh, right. My first memory of money. Mm, that's a good question. That's the kind of question that we should ask, uh, but we don't. So I will, uh, I will, I will take that. I think actually one of my first memories of money, certainly the one that's coming to my head now, is when my brother, who uh, is three years younger than me, uh, actually stole some money from my mum when he was about six and uh, went to the sweet shop and bought himself some sweets uh, and came home with it. And uh, so obviously there was kind of lots wrong with this maneuver. One, he was stealing money. Uh, two, he was taking himself off to the shop with uh, no permission. Uh, three, he was buying sweets, but I guess that is a little bit kind of less dubious in the context of the, the other two things. And so in some respects, actually that was my first memory of money, someone stealing it. <laughs> Sounds like a budding entrepreneur. <laughs> Wow. <laughs> yeah, or, or thief. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Carlos. The story that springs to mind around money, and it's, it's a bit of a tangential story about money, is like um, I came to the UK when I was three years old. And so my father's Italian and my mother's from the Philippines. Uh, he bought a, a house here. Actually, there's two little stories around money. Firstly, he had to get a mortgage. He hated the idea of getting a mortgage. He didn't like the idea of owing anyone any money. And so this idea of like money for him was freedom. If he had money in his, he, he didn't want to be in debt to anyone. And then the other thing was like, we didn't have very much furniture. We didn't even have a dining table. And so one day someone came around selling the Encyclopedia Britannica. I don't know if you've heard of there's the big encyclopedia back in the day before uh, Wikipedia. So um, at the time, I think it cost a thousand pounds for these like 24 books. He bought them before the furniture. And so there's this really weird thing around, okay, actually this is more important than having a table. And also, so knowledge was important. So I'm going to spend money on knowledge uh, and I don't want to owe anyone any money. And I'm scarred for life because of that. That's a that's a pretty amazing example of like how your how your like the way you spend your money, how it betray like how it portrays or betrays your, your values. <laughs> I do also remember those encyclopedias. Yeah, they were very big though, so you could probably use them as furniture. Oh yeah, that's true. <laughs> 
Cool. Um, we are, as you can tell, like some of the conversation has already started and um, I've, I'm already seeing some, some, a nice theme emerge about imposter syndrome related to money. Um, but I wanted to start off with just your experience. So you guys started this thing called the happy pricing course. Um, and like the words happy and pricing are rarely seen in one space. How did you like, what was, what was the aha moment that led to that kind of um, stroke of insight? Oh, aha moments. Was there an aha moment? Um, so I would say it was a, an emergent process. Uh, ben uh, was part of a program that we run called the 2020 Vision Program. Um, his uh, his expertise and a lot of the research and stuff that he thinks about was around pricing and relationship to money. He He's also got this broader interest. Maybe you talk a bit more about the Buddha and the boardroom aspect and this broader interest around business and doing things better. And then I can maybe then link into the whole happy pricing thing. Sure. Um, yeah, so I guess just going back a little bit, um, I, um, I I kind of have set up and run a number of different companies uh, over quite a long time. And the, the last company that I had, I sold uh, about three or four years ago. And I think there were sort of a couple of sort of motivations behind that. One, it was, it was very keen to do something else. And two, it was kind of, I guess there'd been these sort of parallel tracks in my life. One, which was life as an entrepreneur, setting up businesses and being involved with that. And another sort of track, which had sort of always been a little bit unconnected, was a, a real interest in, uh, in Buddhism and in sort of Eastern philosophy generally. And these things had always been sort of quite separate. And I guess it was a kind of feeling of kind of wanting to bring those two, two things together, which was part of the motivation behind um, selling my last business. But in, when I was running the last business, um, <clears throat> quite early on in that, um, we, we kind of did what many people do uh, when you're starting out. So we kind of went around begging for work. Now, if you'd asked me at the time, I wouldn't have said we were begging for work. But in kind of how we acted and how we behaved and the signals that we sent, we were actually begging for work. And by that, all I mean was, you know, we had lots of conversations with people, uh, really positive conversations or seemingly really positive conversations, um, seemed to be a kind of great connection. And the conversation would sort of wind its way around to money, you know, how much do you charge? What does it cost? And we sort of took the view, which many people do, which it was better to not charge very much in order to get a relationship going. So, you know, we'd always say, oh, I don't know, you know, give us a, give us a, we were selling design concepts, essentially, you know, give us a few thousand, we'll show you what we can do, thinking that that was the way to establish the relationship. And all of those sort of good conversations, all of those seemingly kind of, um, sort of, kind of opportunity, all of those kind of rich opportunities all just kind of fizzled out. And it was never really kind of clear what was going on. And one day I was in another one of these conversations and a uh, conversation wound its way around to money. And like I said, we were selling two big companies, so I knew they had money. Uh, and uh, the conversation winds its way around to money. And rather than taking the line, this was with, with no real plan or insight on my part, more just a kind of accidental, accidental response. Conversation wound its way around to money. How much do you charge? And so rather than saying the, you know, taking the, or give us a few thousand to show you what we can do, I said it costs 45,000. Uh, and so I kind of accidentally put our prices up by about 20 times. And uh, the client, the prospective client bought it straight away. They said, great, let's do it. Kind of no conversation, no debate, just a kind of great, let's do it. And so that kind of a lot sort of changed in that moment. One, we had kind of won a big client, which was really important for our kind of young growing business. Uh, two, we had more money in the organization and money in the organization for any organization, whatever you're doing is a critical thing because it is the oil that makes the organizational wheels spin, whatever the work that you're doing. Uh, and another thing, which was it kind of sparked this curiosity in me, like what actually is happening here? What's happening with money that either kind of makes a decision on the part of your customer or your client harder or easier. What's happening with money about the signals that we send in the world? Uh, and so that, that kind of, there was a whole sort of area of exploration that kind of was sparked in that moment that became very important to the kind of following 10, 15 years of running that business and ultimately that it was then sold. But then kind of just referencing back to the thing that Carlos was talking about, this idea of kind of Buddha on the boardman, Buddha in the boardroom and the kind of movement away from that business. Another thing happened some, uh, some years after that where I was doing a course with a um, meditation teacher of mine and the course was called Work, Sex, Money, Dharma. And so it's about the sort of giant objects of life via the Buddhist lens. And on the, uh, the money section of that, uh, the teacher started by 
basically kind of looking, it was all, it was done video, not dissimilar to this, uh, but all kind of pre-recorded. And the teacher sort of looked into the camera and said, you know, if I say to you, money, 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 what comes up for you? And a huge amount sort of came up. And so there was this sort of realization, I guess all of these things coming together, which is one understanding for as an entrepreneur and as a managing director and owner of a business, that a lot is happening around money and how we make decisions around things. A lot is happening about money clearly and how easy or hard it is to run our business. But then on this other side, a lot, you know, this kind of realization, a personal realization that a lot is happening in our own hearts and minds around stories that we have around money and whether I'm worth it or what's an appropriate amount or what's too much. And so I guess all of these things were coming together a little bit for me over the last couple of years, trying to kind of bring that together. Carlos made reference to a program that Happy Startup School run, which I, I did call the 2020 program. And one of the insights that came out of that for me was as I was kind of moving away from my kind of old world of having run these businesses, trying to explore new things. Actually, one of the things that would be helpful for me to do first is start taking the knowledge that is out of my head and getting that into the world. And one of the areas of knowledge that I had through the examples that I've given was this thing around money. Uh, and so the emergent journey that Carlos refers to uh, was about that. Okay, there is this interest, a desire to bring some of this knowledge to people, particularly people who describe themselves as running purpose-led businesses. Because oftentimes people like that, then, you know, it's like profit, oh, profit's not important. I'm about purpose. But of course, pro profit is the thing which allows you to do more of your purpose. And so we were kind of curious to bring it together and happy pricing is the kind of emergent um, response to that. Anything exactly. to add, Carlos? <clears throat> and that's where, uh, on one hand, it was on brand <laughs> being the happy startup school. So it was a useful way of actually using a, uh, call it, calling it happy pricing. But I think talking to what Ben just finished off with, a lot of people in our community are trying to build businesses that align with who they are so there's this real sense of actually this is not just about the money this is about doing something that makes me happy and creates a positive impact in the world uh, the challenge that we find with lots of the people in our community they think about either the, the the money or the positive impact and they forget themselves and so they're giving 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 and because of that a lot of their endeavors burn out or they burn out essentially because they lose the energy. When it comes to the money bit, it's that a lot of the time when the conversation happens around, okay, how much does this cost? It's the last thing they want to talk about. And as soon as they hear that conversation, it becomes challenging. It becomes difficult. They start second guessing themselves. They don't know where to start. They then tie their, the price that they set to their own self-worth and it just becomes a horrible spiral. And so for me, it was really important with the opportunity of Ben's knowledge and the relationship we built during the program say, actually, how can we help people think about this in a different way and do it in a way that actually feels aligned? So it isn't about just doubling your prices or 20xing them like uh, Ben was saying. It's like, How do you think about pricing in a way that feels like you are coming from a place of integrity, from a place of knowledge, um, but then also not being limited by the stories that you might tell yourself about how much am I allowed to earn? And so that for me is kind of core to the happy pricing journey that we're also exploring together through the people who come onto the course. And, and now Ben was late because he's, he's running a, a coaching program from people who've done the course on actually putting into action some of the stuff that they've learned through uh, the, the content that we shared with them. So I guess what I'm taking away from you guys' story, so, so Ben, like you discovered that being re reassuringly expensive kind of works or worked for you as a, as a pricing strategy, it sounds like. Mm -hmm. um, and that's something that I also see here in, 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 the, in the comments and, and to what Carlos was talking about too. Like we have, to, we have to work on our own personal relationship with money and how we think and the dysfunctional beliefs that we hold about money. Um, so I think that also compounds when you work in a sector, like you mentioned, Carlos, but like purpose-driven, where um, the, the, the profit is, is considered a, a kind of like, you know, uh, something we rather not mention. There's a lot of kind of taboo around making profit, but 
as you as you were highlighting, Ben, it's also kind of the oil that you need in order to make the organizational wheel spin. And to your point, Carlos, like it's also at the end of the day, you got to take care of yourself. And when you don't take care of yourself, you can't really make a difference. What are kind of what would you say are like the number one or two most challenging dysfunctional beliefs about money that you see people struggle to overcome? Oof. Um, I think before I jump into that, I thought what would be, I just wanted to make a, a quick difference, differentiation in my eyes anyway, from what I've learned from Ben. There are the tactics, the approaches, the strategies around pricing and what that means in terms of actually getting to a price that both parties are on board with and see value in. And then there's the beliefs that stop us from doing those things. And so I think there's, there's a, um, because we, when we run this course, um, we know that the beliefs are the things that you need to work on, but the beliefs are, a, are usually the hardest things to work on and the things that people don't want to work on, you know, they don't want to go there. It's the thing, the longest journey, but it's also the place no one wants to go. So we're very aware of that. Um, I don't know, in terms of, so like key beliefs, is there anything that springs to mind, Ben? Um, yeah, I mean, I guess the, the sort of the elephant belief hiding in the room, uh, if there are two elephants in the room, uh, two elephants hiding in the room, one is that I'm not worth it. Uh, and two is that money's not important, which is a, a kind of sort of near bedfellow of that. Uh, and I think a lot, and, and then of course, everybody has their own sort of variations. I know you were making reference to imposter syndrome and those kind of things, but this kind of, I, I'm, not, I'm not worth it um, mm. is pretty pervasive. One mm. thing that, um, one, is it a belief? Maybe it is a belief. Yeah, it is a belief. One of the things, a story I think that is really powerful, particularly um, for people in my community, is, is it fair? Mm. Is it fair that I earn this much money or I ask this person to pay this much money when someone else can't? Mm. And is it, is there, uh, basically projecting what I think is the right price onto the person that I'm working with? So I become their ceiling. I think, actually, no, 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 don't give me that much money. That's not enough. Oh, that's too much. That's too much. And we think actually everyone has that same idea of what a lot is. And what, did, what is the question that you think people should be asking themselves? Oh, there you go, Ben. That's, that's right in your ballpark. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I think the, the key thing around all of this is that, um, that we are not the important person. Like, so in, if you think about when you sell something, which of course, whether you're a purpose-driven, whatever it is there, is, there is a sale happening. And when you provide your service, you sell your thing, you know, we, we benefit, well, you know, we, we benefit once, the seller benefits once. But the person who's buying, they benefit, hopefully, and there is an assumption that there is kind of some goodness in your thing, they benefit over and over and over and over and over again right? Because they enjoy the value forever. We enjoy the transaction once. And the reason that that's a kind of important thing to keep in mind is that the, the, the orientation should never be, am I worth it? Is it fair for me? Because it's not about me. The, the value is a subjective thing. And the person, the only person, the only important point of view in determining what something is worth is your customer. So the point of view that you need to be in their head not in your own for many reasons. And I think on that is, you know, the way I look at it is the same thing that you may be doing could be 5,000 pounds for someone and 50 pounds for another person. And it's, com and there's no kind of objective, universal God-given number for each and every product and service that we have that is fixed and that is the fair price. There, it, it is a spectrum depending on when, who, why, all sorts of things that are totally out of our control unless we understand more of the context that we're in and the person that we're selling to is in. Mm -hmm. So if every situation is 
different? Like, where do you start having un to understand how you can price yourself better? Um, so obviously there are differences depending on if you're selling services or if you're selling products, you know, the, the nature of what you're selling, of course, demands the approach to be different for sure. Uh, so I can sort of talk to, I can talk to some sort of generalities with that really. Um, but I, I think, you know, and, and also whether you're selling something which is new or whether you're selling something which is, which is long established, there's, there's kind of variation with all of this. But in some form, everything, in fact, the, the, um, one of the first things that we do on the course, which is maybe a useful way of talking about it, is, um, is about basically call, what we would call kind of pricing outside in. So spending time thinking and exploring and understanding what is it worth to the person who's buying. And by that, I kind of mean that there's a, a useful kind of reference that we talk about on the course is that customers buy only two things. They buy good feelings and they buy solutions to problems, right? And so what something is worth is wholly contingent on those two things, the good feelings that they're after and the problems that they want solving. And this is true whether you're selling products or whether you're selling services, it makes no difference either way. That's the, these are, this is the lens that people are looking for. They're buying because they want good feelings. Those good feelings, if it's services, might be because they want to spend time with you. The good feelings might be, they might be kind of, they might be other kind of personal things, but there are good feelings. They want to feel a certain way and buying your products and services allow them to feel a certain way. Uh, equally, they want problems solved. So it's never about the what of what you're selling. The what of what you're selling, uh, which kind of sort of sounds complicated, is in service of something else. They're buying it because they want a problem solved. And so you have to kind of keep these things in mind and you have to explore with them, which, you know, if you're selling services can be done on a case by case basis. If you're selling products needs to be done maybe as a slightly more formal sort of research exercise, you need to spend time understanding, well, what are the good feelings that they want, to, that, they are, that they are acquiring through buying my thing? What are the problems that they want solving and how badly do they want that problem solved? And so the, the more time you were able to spend exploring that with your prospects, with your customer base, with your clients, the more you will start to understand what your thing is worth. And like I said, if you have, if you are fortunate that you're selling services, so there is some opportunity to have that conversation on a case by case basis, then I really recommend that you do that, even if it feels convoluted, because it's, it's all about walking in their shoes. And for anybody who is kind of involved on sort of design side, you know, there is a, you'll, you'll have a sort of deep understanding that design is all about kind of walking in your customer's shoes. And essentially that's what we're talking about here. So if you're selling services, there is always an opportunity to get out of your way and into their, into their head, into their heart beforehand. If you're selling a kind of product or, uh, or some other, uh, some, something else, then engaging in some research with key people to get to paint a better picture, to better understand the problems that they are solving and the good feelings that they're after, this will start to point to the value of what you're doing. I recognize it a lot from questions that we get from the facilitators community. So that's the, the brand professionals that we, mm -hmm. we host who are, you know, selling consultancy services within the brand space is that the convention of agencies traditionally is to sell assets and, you know, campaigns, logo sets, strategies, process. These are the phases. This is how much time we're going to spend on it. But generally, no one like no one necessarily wants to pay for all those little steps, but they want to pay for an outcome. But mm -hmm. creativity, I think, also is just notorious and being hard to predict in terms of outcome. And mm -hmm. especially, I think, on smaller projects, smaller brand projects, like you, you can't necessarily say like, okay, well, if we go through X process then there's a guaranteed outcome mm -hmm. um and and i imagine that you probably get a lot of people who are struggling with with similar questions like how do i move away from this kind of you know um menu of like you know the chinese restaurant menu of assets and price mm -hmm. yeah for sure for sure and so the the last business i had was a design business so i know that this one and the thing that people default to is uh yeah, you know, so one of the one of the things you will get a logo, and excuse me, we're spending X amount of time on the logo, and but they're so they're actually linking the price to the time is really what they're they're doing. But they'll kind of show that as a sort of shopping list. Here's a logo. It costs that because I've spent that amount of time on it. So what they they're actually selling is time, 
Uh, and, you know, of course, that's not what a client kind of wants to buy. Now, just uh, the one thing I, I would say is that part of what happens around money is because people, you know, every, well, lots of people are uncomfortable talking about it. And so that's true for people who are selling, but it's also true for people who are buying. And so the thing that happens in the exchange, again, this is more about services than it is a product, people just try and do whatever they can to kind of fast track through the money bit. Uh, and so the kind of seller does that through their ways. And then the, the buyer does that as well. So the reason people start to get sort of stuck on things like selling time and selling assets and those kind of things is it's a, it's a convenient way of kind of moving beyond the money. But what we would say is that if you have a client and you know, maybe taking the design thing just as a way of illustrating the point, you know, you might be talking to a client or a customer who um, is in the market to buy a logo, let's say, or whatever it might be. So they're in the market to buy a logo. And so you have a choice, right? You can basically just try and kind of get out of the messiness of a money conversation as quickly as possible and give them the shopping list and they can make that decision. Or you can have a dialogue with them to understand, well, why? Why do you want a new logo now? What's happening for you? What business, what, you know, what is your business? How much do you sell your services for? You know, what's the change? You know, why this thing? Why do you want it now? And if you don't, if you don't get a new logo now, what's not going to happen for you? Because it's about understanding that they're not buying a logo. They're buying or whatever the what is. They're buying the need to change something. Uh, and the logo they see as in service of that change. And the really, the really critical thing is to understand the thing that they're trying to change, because then you understand what they really want a logo for. And when you understand what they really want a logo for, you're able to have a conversation with them about what the value of that is. Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. I think that's also something that Philippa is, is mentioning in the chat that when you're starting to think about the value that it delivers, you kind of change that thinking away from, from the restaurant menu um, mm. to begin with. Um, so I was I was curious. So for instance, in the in the perp in that purpose-driven entrepreneurship space, um, one of the topics that Marika brings up is as a consultant um, coming in, it can be very um, tempting to say, okay, I'm going to do this kind of Robin Hood pricing strategy where I'm going to work with a couple of maybe the people that I'm not so aligned with to just keep kind of the engine greased up. And then I'm going to have a couple of clients that I'm going to work pro bono for. Um, does it, like, I don't know, Marika, if you, if you want to join the conversation, but um, is that, a, does that, Marika, are you comfortable with that strategy? Because your question is around, should I be communicating that? Or do you actually want to kind of dive in? Like, is that a good pricing strategy to, to begin with? Well, um, I, I'm struggling all the time with if I want to do something and there's no budget uh, because I'm, I'm really opposed to doing work for, for free. Um, but on the other hand, I have a few clients that I can charge really high uh, uh, hourly rates. So there's no harm in me spending some time on causes that are closer to my heart, but it's, it's a matter of principle. So now I have like a, this differentiating uh, price list. So I have commercial uh, fee and I have a non-commercial fee. I usually communicate it, but I'm, I'm, it, it's also very much uh, a matter of, of every time trying to, to get an idea of the budget and, and, and making your quote appropriate for it. So I was wondering if Ben and Carlos have some ideas about whether or not you should work pro bono uh, or, uh, well, I, I'm just interesting to hear what you think. Yeah, <clears throat> should I offer a view, Carlos? Yeah, you, you kick us off then. Yeah. Um, so I'm just curious, curious, Michael, what is it that you do? What do you provide? Uh, I provide um, a brand strategy and, and, and brand design. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and uh, my hourly rates are, are uh, actually not bad mm -hmm. because I have a lot of experience and I, I, I have clients that want to pay for it. So I wouldn't mind doing some things for free. 
Yeah. Uh, so. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. I mean, so I guess the answer to your first question, you know, is it okay to do pro bono work? Only you can answer that. <laughs> is is the first thing. Of course, you know, th that's a decision for you, isn't it? I, I mean, I think the, the general thing, which is, um, you know, th there is a decision to be made, isn't there? Because lots of time people say, I haven't got any money. Will you just help me out? And, you know, you need to make a decision how much of your expertise and creative energy you were willing to hand over in those instances. You know, and I, I would say, you know, that's only a decision that you can make. But of course, each time you say yes to that, you're saying no to something else. So just making sure that you kind of hold that balance correctly. Um, I would say as a general principle that, um, you know, I think what your, what you, your kind of orientation is, is really is right in that, you know, what your work is worth to somebody, to a big corporate client, for example, they have different means to pay and the cost of the problem is very, very different, right? So it is absolutely right that those people should pay proportional to the size of their problem, right? That there is this happy consequence where the fact that they do that means you are able to invest some of your time and resources for people who don't have money sounds like a pretty good strategy to me. So I would have thought that that does make a lot of sense. My one kind of um, sort of invitation to you, if you like, is with the corporate clients, I, I, would, I would sort of park the idea uh, that there is a rate for corporate clients. Because what you are doing almost certainly is you are kind of in the kind of sales parlance, you're leaving money on the table because you know, there is not a type of corporate client. There's not a, you know, the, as, which you well know. There's many different types, and I'm sure within your client base, even on the commercial side, there's some which are much bigger than others, some which, you know, there's many different factors at play determining why they want your, um, your services at that time. So I guess my invitation to you would be to keep an open mind and to find ways of exploring with those people what actually their motivation is, what actually is the value of the work that you might do. And the reason that you should do that is you will find I think very quickly that there are some clients who want and need to be able to pay you more than you are thinking you should be paid for, even though, like you say, you have a, a kind of good rate that reflects your experience because you will, there will be instances where clients do want to pay more. And of course I say that not just because you could earn more for the sake of earning more, but you know, what a nice situation it would be is if there were a few clients who actually were able to make a significant investment, which meant that you could do even less work for those people and even more work for some of those other organizations that you wanted to do. So I guess it's a, a kind of invitation to you to, yes, be more Robin Hood, but to really be Robin Hood and kind of explore what you can do and how you might kind of play it in different, different instances. Keep an open mind. Remember this idea that value is subjective. So it's yeah, not about so, your so this, this is what intrigued me because I've been struggling with the same thing. Uh, I mean, I, I made quotes when I worked in a design firm as well, always based on the amount of hours spent by juniors, seniors, strategists, mm. copywriters, etc. I still do that, but I am struggling with, uh, I mean, in my mind, I think charging for the value is, makes much more sense than charging for the hours. Mm -hmm. But how do you make that switch? That yeah. I find really, really difficult. Mm -hmm. Well, one thing, I know a very good course. <laughs> uh, that would be one thing I'd say. So now, I guess there's a, a couple of just sort of qualifying points around this. There's, there's a lot of talk within the create, the kind of, um, the, the kind of creative space around this idea of selling value, right? And my one just sort of watch out with that, you know, sell, selling pure value is tremendously difficult thing to do. I think, you know, uh, and you, you kind of reference this too. Outcomes are often sort of vague and how can you really sort of attribute, well, I give you this brand strategy and all of a sudden, you know, the value of your product goes from that to that, therefore, you can pay me that and we can all be happy, which is what like this idea of value pricing would sort of talk to. I think because that is so complex, because that is such a unrealistic kind of thing to aim for. In fact, I had a, a client of mine once who I was helping the board of a big design firm and they said to me at the beginning, yeah, but the thing around value pricing is it's like Middle East peace. Everyone wants it, but nobody knows how to do it. 
And, and you know, there's kind of truth in that. It is a tremendously difficult thing. But what happens with that is people go, oh, it's too difficult, therefore I'm not going to do it. And it, what I kind of want people to think about is that there is a spectrum. Right. So at the one end of the spectrum, there is this kind of holy grail, if you like, of uh, value pricing where my work is worth that to you. And at the other end of the spectrum is just the nuts and bolts of selling time. There is this huge kind of play space in the middle, which is more about helping the client start to understand what the value, well, helping the client articulate what the value is. And so that's not about kind of putting absolute numbers on things, but it's helping them start to explore their motivation, helping them start to explore why they're doing things. Like one of the questions which we always get students to ask is, if you ask your clients, what's the cost of not doing this work? So saying to your client, what's the cost of not doing this brand strategy now? And just letting them explain. And what you will start to see is that there are all these motivations which they are actually bringing them to the table in that instance. And those motivations all come with sort of pressures. And those pressures can, in some indirect form, start to be explored financially. So, you know, if we get, and so it's not about an absolute thing. Oh, if I do this, therefore, all of a sudden, your product is now worth 10 times more. It's not that, but it's about the art of understanding what's actually their motivation, what's the cost of not doing it. Mm. Carlos, anything to add? Yeah, well, there's more kind of some reflections based on <clears throat> people that we've met and things that they told us. Uh, so, uh, well, the first thing that sprang to mind about the pro bono work is uh, people pay attention to things they pay for. And and sometimes, and in my experience, when I give something for free, even like doing a webinar like this, uh, if so, 30 people sign up, 30 people aren't always going to turn up if they haven't made an investment or a commitment. Yeah. And so there's something around when you offer something for free in inverted commas, how much, where does the commitment lie? with the the buyer what is it there and someone on our pricing course actually said she doesn't necessarily frame it as discounts or free it's her investment in that business that organization so i am investing in you rather than i'm giving you this away for free and that for me i thought was a beautiful reframing of actually there is value here but i believe in you that's why you're not paying me money I am investing in you. And that total shift. Um, the other thing around what I heard, and maybe I misheard this, but what sprang to mind was this idea of like, you know, the corporate rate and the pro, you know, the the discounted rate or whatever it is. When we think about uh, when Ben talks about people buying good feelings, I think of Tom's shoes and this idea of buy one, give one. If I part of the story of you selling is that you're investing in me so I can invest in them. How does that change the value to the person that you're, the corporate, the business? So it's less about the outcome for them. It's suddenly about the outcome for other people. And people might be willing to pay even more for that. And so that's a way of, I'm thinking like having not the, ro well, the Robin Hood idea, but not so much of robbing the rich. The rich are investing in the poor not the, you're robbing the rich for the poor. So again, that for me was a, an interesting way of looking at it. Um, and, 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 the, and the last thing is like on the, this program that we run, there was a guy who had this whole idea that time equals money, yeah? And so he didn't have enough time to pursue the things he was passionate about or be creative because he had spent all his time on the money. And so reducing the amount of time working on the creative work, the stuff that he wanted to do, meant he would get less money. And so that's where I feel there's this danger of the hourly rate or the, is suddenly you equate your ability to do anything else is at the risk of not earning enough money. And I think that is, if, if the more of us were able to detach this idea of time equals money, the more we would have energy to do the stuff that we can't necessarily get paid for, but needs to be done. We have a digital hand up from Salim. Cool. Salim, are you able to turn audio on? Yeah. Uh, hi, um, I think this is my first time uh, engaging with this community. Welcome. Um, so hi everyone. Yeah, hi everyone. And. Uh, uh, although I joined late, but uh, I think I benefited a lot from what Carlos was saying, and also like uh, that 
Um, so basically, I had an issue with um, with a client here. Um, mostly, I'm based in Nairobi. I'm a freelancer. Um, I do uh, work the you know like uh, in brand and also like in product management. So. Uh, there was this one time I was working with a client on mental health, you know, like uh, I was doing a project for them. And um, so when it comes to now the pricing, the whole pricing of the project, uh, they quoted something that, you know, like uh, that was almost, uh, you know, like 70% less than what I used to quote. Uh, that, that's what they, what they wanted me, you know, like to do that, to, to maybe like uh, uh, earn from that project. And I was like, uh, uh, there's no way, you know, like uh, uh, I'm accepting this. But again, I was really interested in now in the space of mental health and, you know, like how I, ca I can contribute to that because of the COVID-19 and, you know, like all the issues that are going on. So I decided to, you know, like to take the project uh, and say that, you know, like um, uh, if you guys can't afford me or maybe like can't afford the, the, the things that I'm doing, um, that's it. Uh, what I'll do is maybe like do this work for free. I'll just give this to myself, treat myself like, you know, like this project is mine and to find ways to, you know, like contribute to this space. But uh, when it comes to maybe uh, the, the next time that I'm going to, to do a project with you, uh, you know, like consider the value that I'm contributing to your work or maybe to the kind of project that you're doing instead of, you know, like, uh, uh, you know, like uh, uh, talking about the price, but uh, what kind of impact are you making with this project? So that was the challenge that I gave them. But uh, could you please talk about, you know, like uh, the issues that are revolving around, you know, like uh, the pricing in terms of, you know, like quoting the, the, the different locations, you know, like you are in Africa, people tell you that, you know, like uh, you uh, you cannot be paid compared to, you know, like what, you know, like the, the, the other people in the West are paying or something to do with that. Because we do have clients that we're working with from, you know, like US or maybe like UK uh, and they're paying well. But when it comes to, you know, like the companies or maybe the NGOs around, you know, like uh, uh, Nairobi or maybe like any other place, uh, they, they normally, you know, like uh, give us this challenge whereby, you know, like they're saying um, we cannot um, pay you for the, this amount of money or we cannot pay you for, for this hourly rate because like this is not our standard, this is Africa. And I think maybe like that is that has taken a wrap for so many things. Uh, could you please address that? Yeah. That's an interesting question from for for people based in the UK. Mm -hmm. What's your yeah. what's your experience with African pricing strategies? No, well, but I, I think that the thing that I would say is um, what we're saying for everything actually is that value is subjective. So that the important point of view is the buyer's point of view, right? So it's not about whether I have experience or not in selling things in Africa or in the US or in Europe or wherever it may be, is that every time we have a sales conversation, the important point of view is the customer's point of view. So I guess my question to you, when a, when a client in Nairobi says, no, we're not paying those rates because this, you know, we, we kind of pay different rates here. I guess the question is, to what extent are they saying that as a lever to not pay you as much or to what extent are they saying that because there is truth to what they're saying? What's, the, what's their motivation? What's happening for them? So I think um, uh, these, uh, the, the client that at the time I was working with were NGOs that, you know, like were mostly dealing with that. But uh, their whole, you know, like pricing strategy was based on, you know, like a previous client that they worked with. So the idea was, you know, like there's this client that we worked before and we paid them, you know, like this amount of money. And um, I was referred to them as somebody who can do their job and, you know, like who can go give them, uh, the, you know, like the, do for them a, a job that, you know, has quality. And mm -hmm. that was the reason as to why they came to me. And I told them, you, you are referred and, you know, like you are told like that, that I can do um, a, a really a good job for you. And at the same time, uh, you know, like uh, these are my rates. This is what I work with. I even, you know, like uh, show them my portfolio or maybe the, the, the previous work that I did with other clients. And, uh, you know, like their argument was coming from, you know, like the previous uh, uh, other, the other freelancer or other people that they worked before, with before and the kind of, uh, the, and, you, know, like, you know, like the, what they were charging. And I, mm -hmm. the, like, and I told them that it's not that, you know, like uh, people uh, should be compared in terms of, you know, the fact that they worked with you before, but in terms of the value that you are driving from me, in terms of the value that you are driving from this project. 
uh, maybe like uh, you can reason from there. Do we had an, uh, you know, like uh, this argument for two days uh, at the end, you know, like I took the job because I also wanted to kind of, you know, like positively contribute to that space. And um, it was amazing, but uh, I think that is something, you know, like it, it was not my first time, you know, like I encountered with that issue. Uh, uh, I think maybe like it is something that revolves around uh, uh, some freelancers who are working for, you know, like at a cheaper rate and doing, uh, although like they mostly don't do, you know, like excellent work, mm -hmm. you have to, again, you know, like, uh, 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 like let's say somebody, uh, you have given a translation job to somebody who's new to the space, or maybe who doesn't really understand the standardization of, you know, like translation or maybe any, um, uh, or the language that you're targeting. And then uh, later on, you are forced to clean up, you know, like the whole, uh, the whole project because uh, of the, the terrible work that they did for you. <laughs> but again, uh, that is what really, uh, you know, like I think what really fuels is, you know, like the people taking cheap rates uh, for the, the for, or the people they dealt with, you know, like on their previous project. I think that's where, where they're coming from. And, you know, like when they see you quoting, you know, like uh, uh, an enormous amount of, you know, like uh, money or maybe like saying that the, the, they somehow, you know, like, um, uh, they, they somehow, you know, like uh, uh, start, you know, like having issues with those uh, pricing. Uh, so I think maybe at the end of the day, uh, that is where the problem is. Yeah. yeah, yeah, you're you're going you're going quite fast. I think Carlo Carlos was raising his hand. I'm not sure if you had uh, a particular yes, point. Oh no, I just wanted to make sure I understood uh, the situation. Uh, as, as the way it came across was this client had employed someone else before you at a much lower rate, and so they were comparing your prices against their prices. Is that part of the situation? Is that correct? Oh, I think that's a yes or is that a yes or a no? Does anyone? <laughs> <laughs> it's a smile. <laughs> it's a smile. I think I, that's that's certainly how I, I heard. That's it how I understood well. it. And yeah. so, I think one of the things that's that's springing up for me, you know, with whoever you're working with, there's an assumption sometimes that we think our clients actually understand what the value is of our work. Uh, and uh, one of the things I'm learning is it's actually incumbent on us to educate our clients as to where the value is, or ex like Ben says, explore the value. Because um, if we assume that they see the same picture as you do, the same number, the same outcome, then that's where there's pro potential cross purposes. And, and what I heard with Salim is like, these are my rates, these are the numbers I work with. If suddenly they look at those numbers and they don't match with the worldview in the client's head, then you, you really started a, a kind of cross purposes. Mm. Mm. So part of what I'm, you know, Ben's talking about for me is like this idea of how do we get onto the same page before mm. we even talk about a number? Yeah, and, and I think what, what Salim was speaking to sounds like if you're in the process of kind of experimentation of like, okay, well, how do I work with clients to get to that? happy price it sounds like it's not something that you're going to learn from one project to the next but that's just kind of like an education that we all need to go through um so first experiment you might fail second experiment to to find kind of that range that ben was talking about of like full value-based pricing and like restaurant menu pricing there is a glider on that scale and you can explore how far you can go with that um one of the tips that I always give in our trainers program is that it's very handy to ask your previous clients what the real value was for them, because they are the best ones to actually articulate what the bigger picture is. So for instance, we have clients who talk about like, hey, it's just amazing when people already know your brand when you walk into the room for a fundraiser that, you know, it saves us like 2000% of the effort or uh, a founder of a company who's just very relieved that his entire team can tell the brand story because that takes away like hours and hours of his time a week having to do every single pitch himself. So I think these anecdotal stories also help you to form an idea of what the, what the value of, of your work potentially could be. Um, I was gonna say- the, Sorry, go ahead. Just a quick one, particularly on Salim's uh, situation that this came up for me. Um, there's, uh, well, firstly, um, we, sh we should have choice in this whole situation. Mm -hmm. Just because like a client doesn't want to pay us the amount that we want from them doesn't mean we have to work with them for a lower price. 
you know again if needs must and you have to you know pay the rent or pay whatever of course okay do what you need to do but i don't think we should just apologize for you know and and go all right i'll do that for that price i don't think that's that's useful for us and on the other side is like there are an, other ways to share in the value how can they give you the right case study talk about your work you know how can you have you know get the value from them in other ways that then enhances your brand and the, and, and the work that you do um and that for me you know it, it's no longer about okay i'm just going to reduce my rates it's like okay i'm going to do this but there's another quid pro quo here yeah and then the final thing is like maybe there's different ways and this is, ben talks about this on the course there's different payment terms okay you can't pay me everything now but what if we spread it out so you're giving them an option to get you for the value that you create even if they don't have the money right now because you're confident about what you're going to give them and another point that Marika touched upon that I think kind of connects with what I'm hearing Salim say is that there's also we there are some assumptions that are often made about who has money and who doesn't. And if that's actually true to your point, uh, Ben, earlier about like, well, do they really not have the money to pay you international rates or do they simply not want to? That's a difference. Because um, I think there is this assumption that not-for-profits don't have money and businesses do. I think actually very often it's the opposite. Yeah. Like small businesses are very limited in their funds, not-for-profits. Uh, many that I know are extremely well endowed um, and actually, you know, can afford things easily, but also get a lot of free stuff thrown at them. Um, and I do also think that it's important to kind of assess some of those assumptions that you're making in your head, like, oh, corporates can pay, but not for profits cannot. Um, and actually, when I first en entered the social impact space, another one of our speakers, Roshan Paul, a couple of uh, months ago about building careers of purpose, he said, you'll never make it in the social impact space because you don't know how to ask for stuff for free. <laughs> I was like, oh, that's a, uh, that's a pretty fantastic forward tip. Um, what, um, uh, what was, what was coming up was a major point from, from Hadas as well about like this, this sense of like imposter syndrome, um, because we, we might have a few minutes left to address that because I, I think that's a pretty big one. So the sense that like, I don't have the confidence to ask for what I think my work is worth. Do you have any kind of, of course there's never a silver bullet, but do you, do you have any, any kind of, um, tips of how you've seen people work through that towards a more healthy idea of um, what they're actually worth. Mm. Um, I mean, I think I'll offer a quick view and then Carlos, please offer as well. I mean, I, I think um, for me, this all comes back to the thing we're talking about at the beginning, this, that, you know, the more time you spend understanding value, understanding how your client sees value, it just gets you out of, you know, it removes you a little bit from the thing because you never, like you said, there's no kind of sort of silver bullet or magic wand that all of a sudden makes that imposter syndrome go away. So you have to accept the imposter syndrome is going to hang around with you. So if the imposter syndrome is going to hang around with you for a little bit, know that, acknowledge that, and now let's spend time understanding what our client or customer thinks, because theirs is the important view, not your imposter. Theirs is the important view. What's it worth to them? And then you can you can just hold your imposter's hand and have the conversation with the client about what it's worth to them. Hmm. Um, so a couple of things that spring to mind. The question, the first question for me is, um, how confident are you in your abilities? You know, and I'm assuming lots of you here have you know spent many years doing your work, and so you know how to do your work. Um, and then the second one uh, is, it's kind of like, what, what's, the, what's the danger of rejection? Because I think sometimes for me, imposter syndrome is like, oh, I'm scared they're going to say no, or I'm scared they're going to judge me about the, what the price I'm going to give or, or how I'm going to talk about my work. And so this is a bit of a deeper thing for me. It's, it's less about a pricing strategy or understanding how it's in customers' head. It's, it's more about how do I reframe this relationship with the person I'm going to work with, less about am I good enough to work with you, and more about what is my intention for you. For me, stepping in a relationship, what would I love for you as my customer? 
uh, one of the things that we get our uh, people on our program to do is to write a love letter to their customer. To think about who is that person? What is that, what is getting in their way? What is it where they wish for their world and the, and the people around them? And how would I love to contribute to that? Because it's less, like Ben was saying, then it's less about me. It's about what is it that I can make better in their world? And if they reject me, well, more fool them because they've met someone who authentically wants to help them. And less about, actually, I'm not good enough. It's just they're not seeing what I can give to their world. And that, for me, that's a kind of a deeper journey around this. How do I create value for other people? Mm. I love that. A love letter to the customer. Maybe also every now and then a love letter to yourself. Yeah. <laughs> Cool. Um, ben and Carlos, it's, it's, it's a few minutes after the hour. I don't know if you have time for one last question or if you want to, if you need to wrap up. I know that you guys already sat on a few webinars today. Uh, that's good. Zoom joy, not Zoom fatigue. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, okay. I can do one more. I'm going to run off in a little bit and do the school pickup, but I can do, okay. uh, so I'm a little bit squeezed, but I can definitely cool. do a quick question. Well, here's someone that I know will have a good question. Um, Howard. Uh, Howard take the stage. Oh, thanks, no pressure. Eh? Yeah, <laughs> I think my, mine's a, a little bit more of a philosophical question. I don't know if you deal with in this course or what your kind of personal thoughts are, if you've got any anecdotes around, but it's, it's again, it's that kind of, we, we also get stuck into this thing of, well, I, I mean, this, it's a question around value. So does value just have to translate into money? Um, and I think you've spoken to it a little bit there, but, you know, I just wonder, I think for me, a lot of the greatest projects I've worked on have been diving the deep end, total risk, and then stuff has just morphed out of there. Or the other thing is, you might not necessarily get a monetary value out that is the equivalent to the value put in, but the value of experience, of uh, you know, an opportunity to try a new approach to work, work on something that stretches you, challenges you. I mean, how do you guys sort of measure for that kind of thing as well? Ooh, love that question. <laughs> um, so for me, uh, the way my first response is thinking of business uh, as a spiritual journey, not a money-making machine. How do I think of this journey of building a business as essentially a journey of personal growth? And, and that you know, I, that's then is a case of you choosing the right clients and the right experiences that align with the growth that you're looking for. And so when you go into something, it isn't purely about money. It's not forgetting about money, but it's also realizing actually I'm doing this because there's something I'm going to get out of it more than the money, which is, I think is what everyone's here for, because you're here about some kind of impact, but also I hope something about you're going to learn about yourself and something a story you'll be able to tell in the future so that's uh, that's how i would think what well, my initial sort of opening around that anyway yeah and i i would i'd agree I and mean, thanks thanks howard that's a, a great great question i i would agree with carlos i think you know for me you make choices around what energizes you what gives you joy what gives you enthusiasm what excites you i think the whole purpose behind what we're talking about here is and also then don't compromise on the pricing thing. So yes, make choices around, because I think Carlos referenced it earlier, there's always choice. Do I choose to work with you? Do I choose to do this? Do I choose not to do this? So choose joy, choose enthusiasm, choose excitement, and then engage with those people around what the kind of financial value of that is. Mm. I think the last thing I'd put on that is to make a choice, you have to have some guiding principles. And I think a lot of the time, what most people who are in business have forgotten is like, why am I doing this in the first place? What's my North Star? What are my boundaries? What do I say yes or no to? And without that, you'll take anything. <laughs> or you'll base it purely on the money. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to sit with that thought for a little bit. Um, thank you guys so much, both of you, for coming to speak thank to us you. for free, I might add, <laughs> without any compensation. Always the joy, uh, the experience. <laughs> putting putting the spiritual <laughs> practice uh, to work. Um, I really appreciate it. So 
Um, any other questions that you guys have on the topic? Um, I'm happy to hang out a little bit more um, after Carlos and Ben have to sign well, out. I'm happy to hang out for a few minutes. I've got my son to do up the do the school run instead. Oh, wow. <laughs> you've outsourced it. Can he do my school run? <laughs> <laughs> Give me the details. Um, I'll text him right now. <laughs> yeah, cool. Um, for for so for anyone who who wants to hang out a little bit longer, feel free to stay. Ben, thanks so much for for all of your thoughts. Very, oh, very, thank very you. Helpful. And you know, any questions that come beyond, you know, filter them through. Happy to engage on LinkedIn or wherever it might yeah, be. Yeah, um, sure. So stick the details in there. But thank you very much, and wish you all well. Cool. Later, thanks, Ben. ben. Bye bye. Stay safe. Um, we also have a survey that Wanju shared in the chat to um, get your feedback on this hangout and what you might want to talk about next. Um, I might just see like money, 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 money more about money uh, coming in on the survey. Um, cool, Hadas, you have your hand up. Any unresolved, any unresolved questions? Always. <laughs> Um, basically, what uh, I wanted to ask, uh, uh, what I wanted to ask is, is, is regarding the the brand positioning of us as brand purpose professionals. Because uh, I heard what Mariette said, and I find that sometimes, because I'm working with business for purpose, and I or, or, or I talk about it, so where is my uh, differentiation. Uh, where do I uh, do things for purpose? What is? Do you understand what I mean? Like, if I want to engage another model, another social model in the pricing, in the uh, original pricing model, but sometimes I feel I want to be more um, sincere, like to walk the talk. If I help businesses to purpose, then I should have also a purpose. Does, does it sound clear to be like aligned with my uh, not just because of it, it's the audience but also because I give extra something if you don't know what it is but just to be sincere um, the sun is like I have to that's, so what I heard there and correct me if I'm wrong is this something around authenticity and <laughs> Well, I think it's about finding finding like-minded um, collaborators, like-minded clients. I heard something about you said a sense of what's my something around differentiation. So, what's the differentiation, and something about aligned with my purpose? Is that? Yes, you... yes. It's about it's about like if if I help, okay, like uh, if I help social entrepreneurs, okay, and. Um, I give them the same solution as I will give not social entrepreneurs. I'm just giving an example. Then there is something in me, the minute I branded myself as a person who help social entrepreneurs, how, how am I different in the pricing, in the technique, in the, in, the, in the fact that I volunteer more, or do you understand? Like I want to be, I want to be a social entrepreneur giving social entrepreneurs services. I do, like, this is really connecting, connected to what Marianne, Marianne said about doing something either pro bono or volunteer or, or, or doing something also that is not just service or product, doing something that is me as an entrepreneur, as a purpose-oriented entrepreneur helping other purpose-oriented businesses. Like something that is more integrity. I don't know if it's implicit. What I heard. So what I'm hearing is this idea of um, there's a personal purpose. There's something that a, a change that I want to see happen in the world, um, and so that's the essentially nearly the filter of okay, this is this is where I come from. This is the things that I'd like to work on. I might volunteer on this stuff. I might talk about these things. And then I want to help purpose-driven entrepreneurs. And so there's something around, okay, does my, my purpose or the things I want to see happen align with what you're trying to do? And so there's a, a kind of a connection there. Uh, and then there's, okay, I then might work for other people who might not be social entrepreneurs, but where's the connection with them? What's the thing that defines my kind of body of work and the way I want to 
essentially uh, who I want to work with and the things I want to work on. Is that a close articulation? Yeah, uh, it, 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 I think it is. It's just, uh, it's just the fact that, that I'm asking myself, is that enough? Like helping out, like saying I'm working with social entrepreneurs, I'm helping out. Is this, is this enough? Or as a, as a person who gives services, uh, for purpose-oriented people, do I have to add, not add, like, is it, uh, maybe I need to write it down before I say it, uh, so it will be more clear. But I feel that there is a lack of, uh, you know, like, I don't want it to be just a brand, uh, um, you know, like, differentiation, the fact that I work with social entrepreneurs. I want well, it to something, be something you, much um, more you holistic. Yeah. Exactly. Not yeah. just saying it's Exactly. It, it, one of the sayings we have on our program is like values, uh, live them, don't laminate them. It isn't this thing like, oh, these are my values. Buy me because of them. It's actually, exactly. I live the things that I believe in. Is that? Okay, cool. Okay, uh, you thank know, you. Terms, there's the branding aspect of it. I think Anne can talk to that more. Um, for me, so the three core values of the Happy Startup School are learning, play and friendship uh, we used to have lots of others we had a manifesto i always remember those i always remember those because i i'm you remember the story about the um <clears throat> encyclopedia britannica i i i inherited that need for learning from my dad is like learning is valuable play is valuable i need to have a space where i can be creative i need to be open i you know, without space to play i i don't do my best work and friendship i think that's why we build community we want people around us who we can consider as friends not just customers and because of that we will do things for them that doesn't have to do always do with money so that's my reflection on what you're talking about that who i work with i could work with glaxo smith client i could work with a charity down the road as long as those three things are addressed and then i feel like okay this me this feels right and then that comes out in the way we talk, the way we present ourselves, the way we design stuff. So that, that's that's how I reflect on what you're talking about there. Yeah, I guess from a brand perspective, I think that's really important. Like the like-minded spirit is really important. When you're thinking about then how you position it and put that in the market, well, we do know from a lot of research in the in the commercial space as well as the impact space, is that when people feel like they're only connecting on similar values, but they're not actually getting a product that is just as good as the product without those values, then people are not going to go for it. So if you're counting on people purely to hire you because you're a like-minded spirit, I think that's a very dangerous one. So you'll need to lead with expertise within a particular industry. Like, why are you connected to social entrepreneurs? It's it's not just out of like idealism or necessity, but it's also because you know a lot potentially about like how do you sell great ideas for change? And I think that is really, really important to think about. So for instance, when we see a case like Tom's, it's very often used as like, oh, you know, great example of like a business that does good and therefore is very popular, but you can't isolate out the fact that that model of shoe was extremely popular and hit a nerve with people. If they would have been horrendous shoes, I can guarantee you the whole one for one model would not have taken off because there would have been no one who wanted to walk around with those shoes. So I think that's that's often not so visible when it comes to business services where people are involved, but your ability to say like, yeah, okay, I share your values, but I'm also going to be the best. I'm gonna be better than the next guy who comes along in helping you to get this in front of more people or you know, and and I think I think that those are some of the things that we tend to not be so strong at in the social impact space is that we rely too much on people's goodwill uh, and on like-minded kind of kindred spirits. So if you need to negotiate, for instance, I was in a situation a couple of years ago where I wanted to talk about a partnership with Unilever. Um, that's a really tough position to come in if you're just going to be like, well, you guys want to see change and I want to see change. So, you know, match made in heaven. Um, no, so you, you kind of, you, you really need to establish an expertise. So from, from a brand, uh, yeah, from my own experience, that's definitely um, finding, finding the things that actually impress uh, those clients in terms of results is also still really important. 
I have a story, uh, I think, that relates to this. Um, <clears throat> so the, the phrase that springs from is to live the work. You know, uh, by living the work, really understanding the the problems that people are, uh, are facing and, and always working on them, you just become an expert because you're always in it. You're always doing it. You you fail, you fail, but you learn. And along the way, you start to, to have this kind of intuitive knowledge of how to solve problems. This in the service space, I'm thinking. Now, um, we don't necessarily work with companies in terms of what we do. We, we run a, a retreats and we run uh, a festival and we run workshops. It's usually for individuals. And we had a company approach us because someone came to one of our festivals and said, could you do a uh, basically a, a workshop for the whole company around culture for a day? Um, and, and it's like, we've never done that before. But what I said is like, what we do is we help talk about happiness. We talk about aligning yourself to, your, to what you really wanna do. We talk about connection and we talk about creativity. We can do that. If you want that, we will do that for you. And we will do it for this much. And it's, it was a number out of the air. And I said, yeah, we'll do that. Thank you. And, and it wasn't a company that we'd never necessarily worked for in the past. We wouldn't have sought them out. But it was like, we, we represent this. If you want this, we will work with you. If you don't, then we, we're not the right fit. So that for me, in a sense, is like, we were experts in what we do. We're not trying to get into places that we don't know, you know, we don't know anything about. But at the same time, it has to align to the things that we want to create for people, the values that we want. We wanted to go into that company and have people come out thinking, wow, now I know why I'm doing what I'm doing. And I want to work with all these other people because I'm feeling more connected to myself and to them. And what they do with that in the business is up to them. But we believe that that would really make a benefit. And it aligned with what they wanted ultimately, um, which wasn't just a day workshop for spend some time with their employees is actually we want to make a stronger team so i know it's just a story that sprang to mind as, as where i felt like you know you we weren't experts in 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 corporate workshops but we knew exactly what we could bring to the table or in, in other words you didn't have an imposter sy syndrome <laughs> no we had a, <laughs> we had a, a wish we wish for everyone in here to come away feeling happy even though it was the first, no, exactly, even though it was the first time. So, yes, you believed in your values and that it doesn't matter what the size of the people or the constellation is. Yeah. Okay, I, I see. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, Salim had one more question about the ethics of pricing. Um, uh, and to add on that, um, uh, or also like, uh, uh, there is this uh, person that once approached me, you know, like he wanted to start a startup um, uh, that, you know, like at the time they didn't have uh, any investment or maybe like anything to do with that. But they were like, you know, we want you to, we want to invite you to work with us for the next six months. We are not going to pay you. Uh, and, you know, like they were not giving me any kind of, uh, uh, you know, like uh, equity shares or something to do with that shares of their business or something. So they told me like uh, after... After six months, we are going to like uh, uh, to do something for you. If we get funding, if we don't get funding, uh, that means like that that work was for free. If we get funding, uh, we are going to pay you fifteen percent of what you are paying our developers and also like our designers combined. And uh, somehow, you know, like uh, that kind of uh, gave me a bad notion about this. Uh, so maybe like uh, while you are talking about ethic, uh, ethics, could you please start to touch on something about, you know, like uh, uh, on, you know, like what can happen, you know, like on early stages on startup, you know, like the things that they do, or maybe like when they give you certain deals or maybe something to do with that. <laughs> so they weren't even giving you sweat equity. Well, that's interesting. Um yeah, I don't know. It's, ethics is a is a big word for me. Um, the thing that springs to mind is trust. Yeah, it is it, trust and and um, whether you trust them and also whether you believe in that project. You know, um, I'm happy to work for free on a project if I believe in it and and it's something that I want to see happen. But it isn't. I'm giving you my time for free or, oh, it would have cost this much and, and now I'm going to give it to you for free or you're going to pay me later. Like I, I intentionally step into that thinking 
I want to make this happen. And so I'm going to spend my energy on it. If it's like, okay, do this work and maybe we get funding and we will maybe pay you. Okay. One thing is, I think my perspective, it's trust. Do you trust that they're going to do this? And the other one is like, am I willing to take the risk? Because in the end, it's, it is risk. You know, you, if you don't know you're going to get paid, you're going to have to just fingers crossed that they're competent enough or you do a good enough you all do a good enough job to have someone want to invest in you but i think if you go into that situation in my perspective with eyes wide open and not risk your own well-being and your own business because of it then i i don't know if there's an ethical thing there other than i I think in a way what it does is a proposal like this kind of betrays the ethics of the person who's making the proposal so for instance, as an employer, I think it's extremely important that the people that I work with, that they can make a living wage, that they can support their families, that they have health care benefits, that they have uh, potential to retire in a couple of years. You know, So the fact that someone would come out and give you this extremely risky proposal is just such a sign of like their world and what they're able to risk in their own life. And it has nothing really to do with, it, it really shows a disregard, I think, for, for what's happening in your life. And it reminds me of, um, so some of, uh, I know some brand professionals sometimes play with this idea, like, yeah, I'll work for you for free in return for some sweat equity. But even then, if you, if you think about the fact that nine out of 10 businesses fail, that means that the return, let's say you work on one of these projects um, for free, it means you need to do 10 projects for free um, until you get, let's say, to, to get into the range where you might really score big with one. So that one pro- project that needs to return such a huge payment that it makes up for the 90% of the other work that will never harvest anything. So I think these kind of proposals are interesting for people who understand that game and who really, you know, whose, whose work potentially um, has a chance of, of giving that kind of large return. But I think for everyone else, it just sounds like a really crappy deal. Sounds like a really crappy deal. And maybe it's good to like read up on like, you know, how to, like, how to negotiate, because I also think like, but someone's making you a proposal where there is no benefit to you. Why would anyone take a proposal where there's like, there's something about like, meet you halfway. And I, yeah, I really feel like, Salim, I want to go out to these people on your behalf and tell them to uh, <laughs> F off. Uh, <laughs> and uh, yeah, but I understand that different, like different, you know, different um, situations, of course, uh, different context um, also give rise to different kind of business proposals. But even more so, I think, in a, in a you know, place like Kenya, where, where, where life is not exactly uh, a bed of roses, I think it's even more important that people um, offer, uh, you know, work opportunities that um, just are reliable and safe and healthy financially. So, um, yeah. Um, uh, okay. <laughs> sorry. Uh, now I, it's, it's my turn to have to sign off because I, I also have a kid pickup moment at the end of my days. Um, Salim, if you want to, um, let's have continue the conversation on the platform if, you, if you're there. Okay. No, no, I, I just wanted to share that part where, but you know, like uh, the compensation that they are giving, but that's okay. okay. I'd love to, I mean, sounds like sounds like you are part of some intriguing, uh, intriguing pricing discussions, um, but um, good for you for kind of like, you know, go, taking on these experiments and trying to um, find your way in it. Thanks, Carlos. Thanks again for sharing, uh, sharing your enjoyed uh yeah enjoyed i always love doing this stuff so yeah more than happy yeah. to uh, thank you very much thanks so much awesome. see you guys all soon we have uh we don't have a community hangout in august but in september we'll have a big global meetup if you have a brand that you want to put in front of the community get feedback on um you're super welcome to apply to be one of the three people who'll get a chance to put their questions in front of the whole brand of change community. Carlos, if you know of someone or you want to um, put, have a startup school in the hot seat, uh, welcome to. Um, uh, Philippa, uh, I know you're working on something. Um, uh, Maria, um, hope to see you guys soon. For those of you who are heading into summer holidays, I hope you have some relaxing 
uh, time off. And for those of us in the Southern Hemisphere where it's winter, that's fine. <laughs> you See too. You guys okay, bye-bye, everyone. Bye.